Okay, so I'm going to get started. Um, today's announcements are the Chapter 2 sapling, which has been open for a while. Um, I'm finishing up the last little bit of Chapter 2 today, so I'm setting the due date for Chapter 2 sapling as next Wednesday. As a reminder, all the saplings are going to be due um, 9 a.m., the same time class starts. Um, please don't email me and tell me that you thought it was 9 p.m. I had a bunch of people do that for Chapter 1. Um, so I'm announcing it in lecture, and it's also set on the sapling page. It's 9 a.m. Um, OK, so chapter three is now open. Um, I haven't set the due date for that yet, but I recommend um, sort of working through it as we're going through chapter three. OK, um, everyone's finished up taking the recitation quiz at this point, so I posted the, quiz for, uh, the key for quiz one. Um, and then we have the exam Tuesday next night, 7 to 9 p.m. in Chem 140. And the exam review is Sunday, 3 to 5 p.m. in Dwayne G1B20. OK, um, any questions about those? OK, cool. So last bit of chapter two. So last time we looked at um, Newman projections and how to graph energy versus dihedral angle. Um, so a little bit more about that. And then we'll spend the last little bit of the chapter looking at physical properties. OK, um, so. We sort of saw um, the graph for butane. There's multiple different energy levels depending on which type of stagger to which type of eclipse. Um, so we can actually use that to calculate out um, <clears throat> how much each particular interaction costs. So energy cost in kcals per mole. And then how we actually get there based on what we know of ethane and butane now. So we know that we saw three different types of eclipse. HH eclipse, methyl H or CH3H eclipse, and methyl methyl eclipse. And then we saw a fourth type of interaction, which is the methyl-methyl gauche. OK, so HH eclipse, um, let me actually write out the math for that first. We know that for ethane, we have, um, I guess I can draw it real quick here, but we have this conformation where we've got three separate HH eclipses and we know that costs about three-ish kcals per mole. Um, so that's three, but that's three of this interaction going on. There's three separate pairings of an H eclipsing another H. So if that's three, um, divided by three eclipsing interactions, that tells us that each one of those is going to have to be one kcal per mole per HH eclipse. So we can pretty much just split it up evenly. Um, it's slightly off from one because the updated value is actually 2.9 instead of three, but close enough, it's one-ish. Okay, um, so questions about how that works. Okay, cool. Um, so the next one we can look at is a CH3H eclipse. Um, which turns out if we're looking at butane, we've got um, one confirmation where we end up having a couple of CH3H eclipses, so like this one here and this one here. And then we also have an HH eclipse, which we already have figured out as one. So this one we can do, we know the energy for this thing overall is 3.6, but we're going to subtract 1 for the HH that we already know is there. And then we're going to divide that by the 2 um, because we have two of these interactions. So that works out to be 
1.3. So in other words, a methyl H eclipse costs you about 1.3. Okay, CH3, CH3 eclipse, we can do similarly. For butane, again, it's going to be a different conformation. I'm just going to write out what we do, but um, 5.3 here minus 2 because there's two HH eclipses in that form is going to be 3.3. Okay, and then the CH3, CH3 gauche is pretty easy. It's just 0 0.9 because um, the one gauche projection of butane we had cost 0 0.9 overall, and that was the only interaction going on. Um, just in case you're wondering, methyl, methyl is the only gauche interaction where it's actually big enough to cost you energy. So I may as well add in one more row here, is any other gauche interaction um, in butane. So like HCH3 gauche or HH gauche, we know is going to be zero because the projections where we have a bunch of other gauche type interactions going on, it works out to be zero energy. Okay, so we can actually use these to predict the energy of conformations of things that are more complicated than butane. For example, this thing has a couple methyls on the back carbon. But if we're looking at this, okay, so we've got no eclipsing interactions. Nothing is eclipsing anything else. Um, but we do have one gauche interaction. This one here, those methyls are a little bit closer to each other than they would like to be. So this one is costing us 0 0.9. Um, quick check, there's no other gauche that has two methyls next to each other. So the energy of this thing overall is 0 0.9 kcals per mole. Or if we look at the same molecule in a different conformation, maybe if we keep the front carbon the same and rotate the back one, so we got CH3, CH3, and H, we know this costs us 1, we know this costs us 1.3, and this costs us 3.3, so the total should be about 5.6. So you can more or less add them up. Um, it turns out sometimes the molecule has a little bit of wiggle room, and so the values might change just a little bit. But these still give you a pretty accurate idea of how good any of the conformations are. Question? How did you get these values? Where did you get these peaks? Um, so the graph that I drew up last time, that's where the peaks of the, uh, the heights of the peaks were. And in terms of um, where those came from, experimentally, um, it pretty much comes down to slowing these molecules down to a really low temperature and seeing like how much energy you have to hit them with to get them to actually spin. Um, there's more to it than that, but pretty much like the heights of the graph um, that I drew last time have like 5.3, 3.6, 0 0.9 is sort of the height settings for kcals per mole. Um, okay, question? So. So what I'm trying to do is figure out like how much, like out of these three interactions, like how much each one costs me. So like here, I already know HH from up here costs me one kcal per mole. So I can drop, subtract one from that. And then I know 3.6 is like the energy of this whole thing overall based on that graph I put up last time. And so I know half of that remainder, like 3.6 minus one of that, half of it has to be from this interaction and half has to be from this one. So I'm going to divide that by 2, which gives me 1.3. So if I add these up, I should get 1.3, 1.3, and 1, which adds up to 3.6, which is where that height of the peak was on the graph. So, yeah, so a lot of this is just sort of like we know it takes this much energy to get over the energy barrier when it's rotating, and so we can sort of work backwards and figure out like what each individual part contributes to that cost, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, so other questions about this or how to apply it? I guess this week's lab is sort of working through some practice examples of this and like actually playing with the models and rotating them too. So that helps to make it more visually clear what's going on. Okay. Alrighty. Cool.
All right, so the last part of this chapter is a little bit about physical properties. which have less to do with what's going on at the molecular level and more to do with like the bulk behavior of molecules. So if you're actually like working with these things in a lab, um, what sort of characteristics do you have to worry about? Um, so physical properties generally include things like melting points or MP, boiling points or BP, um, density, solubility, and there's a bunch of others, but those are probably the biggest four that are useful to know. Okay, so boiling point, if you remember from Gen Chem, um, is the temperature where the vapor pressure of the compound Um, equals the atmospheric pressure, which is defined as being like a standard of one atmosphere. Okay, so if we're looking at physical properties, so I mentioned when we introduced N-alkanes a few lectures back that um, going up through the N-alkanes, like methane, ethane, propane, butane, was a homologous series. Um, they only vary from each other by adding one extra methylene unit into the middle of the chain. And so their physical properties are going to vary in sort of a smooth, continuous manner. Um, so for N alkanes, um, it turns out if you graph boiling point versus number of carbons, um, it's a smooth curve. OK, so popping over here on the board. Um, so if we do so number of carbons here, obviously that's going to have to be sort of discrete markings because you can't have like a fractional amount of a carbon atom. Um, but it follows this sort of like smoothly varying sort of logarithmic looking curve where it starts out a little bit steeper and then like curves less and less but it's still increasing as you go along. Okay, so um, what are we actually measuring um, sort of indirectly on the molecular scale when we look at boiling point? Um, BP is related to intermolecular forces um, in the liquid state of the molecule. So it's basically when you have this thing in the liquid phase, um, how much are those molecules going to stick together? Because the more they stick together, the less likely they are to split up and go off as vapor, which means the higher you're going to have to heat this thing if you want it to boil. So <coughs> stronger forces equals more energy needed to vaporize. Which means higher boiling point. Okay, so um, the weakest but the most universal intermolecular force has a few different names. Um, van der Waals or dispersion forces. Um, are pretty much the only thing holding these N alkanes together. And they're caused by um, 
attraction between temporary dipoles. Okay, so think of it in terms of maybe you've got some long N alkane molecule like this. You've got sort of a general cloud of electron density around it from all of the molecular orbitals that have electrons around the molecule. Um, but maybe at just a certain point in time, maybe some of the electron density is skewed just a little bit more towards the right end of this molecule. Um, so I guess like you could shade it maybe a little bit more over down this end or something. Um, and it turns out that other molecules nearby are going to feel this temporary kind of like sloshing of electron density around the molecule. And they're going to respond in sort of the opposite corresponding manner. So they're going to set up a temporary dipole which points the other direction. So maybe their electron density will get a little bit higher down this end. Um, but now you have an area that's slightly delta negative here and an area that's slightly delta positive. And so you're going to get some attraction between these ends. And also here you've got delta positive and slightly delta negative. You're going to get attraction between those ends. So the molecules, even though there's no like permanent dipole, they're all like nonpolar bonds. It's still going to like stick together just slightly. And any molecule can do this. Um, but it turns out that it works better the longer the molecule is because you could think of it like the molecule is more sloshy, I guess, and it can build up more of a temporary dipole at one end or the other. So it's a stronger effect for longer molecules. So as kind of an example of this, um, if we do this five carbon molecule, neopentane, which has more branching and it's shorter, or in other words, less surface area, Its boiling point is going to be 9.4 degrees Celsius. If we do just regular n-pentane, um, it's got the opposite of that, less branching. It's a longer molecule, and it's got more surface area. Um, its boiling point is going to be 36.1. So just by having the carbons like longer and more spread out versus crowded in together with more branching, that right there is enough to change how much of this van der Waals force you can have going on and how strongly the molecules are going to stick together, which is measurable by the boiling point changing. Okay, so um, there's other examples of intermolecular forces, um, especially hydrogen bonding. But we're going to get into those more later when we start looking specifically at solvents in chapter 8, I think. Um, okay, questions about this? Okay, cool. Um, so one last thing we're going to look at here is melting points. Um, so boiling point depends on how strongly they stick together in the liquid phase. So it makes sense that melting point depends on how strongly they stick together in the solid phase. And it turns out there's more to it than just how much dispersion forces you, go, you have going on. Um, because in the solid phase, you actually have to worry about how these things are packing into like a crystal lattice structure, which turns out to be easier for some types of geometry than others. Um, so this is more of a sawtooth pattern if you graph it. So one line for odd numbers of carbons. And then one line 
for even. So that's actually going to look like um, something that's a little bit tricky to draw. So melting point, number of carbons, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, so I'm going to do one curve up here for even and one curve for odd. Okay, so like one would be on the odd curve, two would be on the even curve, then odd, then even, then odd, even, odd, even, odd, even. And so it's sort of like two continuous curves, but then if you plot all of the carbons together, you get this zigzag kind of line going on. Okay, so it's kind of this one example of what's called an even odd effect, where um, you have more symmetry available to you if you have an even number of carbons. And it turns out that these can pack more efficiently into a solid crystal so they have better intermolecular forces slightly. Which gives you a higher melting point. Okay, so that's pretty much all we're going to cover as far as physical properties now. Um, we'll introduce some more stuff later on as we start looking at more complicated molecules. But for N-alkanes, this is pretty much all we're going to look at. Um, so questions about any of that? All righty. Um, so on to Chapter 3. Okay, so I posted the Chapter 3 notes last night as well. I didn't include that in the announcements, but... Um, those are up too if you want to print them out and follow them along. Okay. So chapter three is where we start looking at actual chemical reactions for the first time. So acids, bases, and curved arrow notation. Okay, so before we get into acids and bases, we got to get our definitions straight. Um, if you remember from Gen Chem, there's actually several different types of acids and bases that we saw. Um, so we're just going to like bring those up again now before we start looking at different behaviors. Um, so one is the Lewis definition. So Lewis acids, which we're also going to call electrophiles. Which we can abbreviate as capital E or capital E with a positive charge. Um, the name actually kind of gives away what they're going to do. Electrophiles love electrons. So electrophiles accept electrons from somewhere. And specifically, it's going to be an electron pair. So we already know from looking at covalent bonds that electrons really tend to go around in pairs. There's lone pairs, there's bonding pairs. Um, same thing here. We're pretty much always going to be looking at electrons moving around as, as a pair. Um, we will see a few exceptions to that with single electron mechanisms, but they don't show up till later. Okay, so Lewis acids accept electrons, which means that Lewis bases otherwise known as nucleophiles or capital N lowercase u or if it's got a negative charge capital N lowercase u with a minus charge um, kinda like the name implies they're like the opposite of electrophiles these things love nuclei they love positive charges because they want to throw electrons at it so these things donate electron pairs. And the act of donating an electron pair sounds generous, um, but 
this is actually described by the shorthand of attacking. So anytime something attacks another molecule, it does it by throwing an electron pair at it. Okay, so that's one definition. That's kind of the most generalized version of what we're going to see. Um, any questions about this before I go erase the other half of the board? Okay, cool. One second. So the other definition of acids and bases that we're going to see in this chapter is Bronsted-Lowry. So Bronsted-Lowry acids, um, these don't get any fancy name, but if we just say like acid or base, we're specifically talking about Bronsted-Lowry acids. Um, so acids donate a proton. And Bronsted-Lowry bases, aka just bases, um, accept a proton. Um, sorry, I guess I haven't written out the shorthand that we're going to be using here. So whenever we're looking at a hydrogen with a plus charge, that's a proton because the nucleus of hydrogen is just one proton with no neutrons unless it's an isotope. So we kind of use H plus and proton interchangeably. Um, I guess if you're taking lab, you'll have seen NMR at this point. So proton NMR is hydrogen NMR. Okay. So Bronsted-Lowry acids are a subset of Lewis acids. If it's donating an H+, it's doing it by accepting an electron pair from somewhere else. Um, so... Bronsted-Lowry acids are a subset of Lewis acids, and Bronsted-Lowry bases are a subset of Lewis bases, but this, the other way around isn't true. Okay, um, 
Okay, so in other words, um, bases are a subset of nucleophiles and acids are a subset of electrophiles. Where it gets really confusing and annoying is sometimes when people say nucleophile, Um, they actually specifically mean something that's acting as a nucleophile, but not a base. So in other words, it's something that donates an electron pair to anything other than a proton. Okay, so we'll see some examples of how this looks in just a second here once we get into curved arrow notation, but this is just sort of a warning that the description is sometimes not as universal as it should be on paper. So this is kind of a good segue to get into how do we actually show these electrons getting passed around. So this is curved arrows. Okay, so a warning. Um, arrows mean a very specific thing when you're looking at a molecular structure. Um, So two electrons moving as a pair. Um, we're going to show that as a curved arrow with a full head on the end of it, like this V-shaped thing at the end. Okay, so I mentioned that we will occasionally see single electrons moving around on their own. Um, in that case, it's not between a nucleophile and an, ele nucleophile and an electrophile. Um, in that case, we call it single electron donor and single electron acceptor. And we'll cover more of this later, but just so it's here for completion now. Um, so one electron moving on its own, we actually use a different arrow for that, this half-headed or fishhook arrow. So those are for radical reactions, which we'll see a few of later. Okay, so in other words, when we're looking at nucleophile-electrophile reactions, which we most of the time are, we're looking at taking electrons from this electron-rich nucleophile and giving them to the electron-poor electrophile. So we're sort of taking from the rich and giving to the poor is how you can think of that. Um, so electrons move from electron-rich nucleophiles to electron-poor electrophiles. Okay, so there's only three legal moves that we can do um, because theoretically you could think of throwing electrons around from anywhere to anywhere else. It turns out there's only actually three valid things that you can do with them, and they're all fairly limited in where they can come from and go to. Okay, so first off is lone pair on an atom becomes a bond on that atom. <clears throat> 
So here's one example. So here's a boron. It's got three bonds to fluorines on it. Um, you'll notice that this boron, um, even though it's neutrally charged, it has an unfilled octet. It doesn't have a lone pair, which means it's got only six electrons around it for its octet. So it's electron poor, it's an electrophile. And if we bring in some electron rich thing, say this fluoride ion, so this is gonna act as an electrophile. Um, this is gonna act as a nucleophile. We know the nucleophile gives electrons to the electrophile, uh, yeah, to the electrophile here, the boron. So we're gonna show the arrow coming out of the electron rich nucleophile. And just to write that up here, um, boron is electron poor, so it's an electrophile. Um, and it can be charged or not. In this case, boron happens not to be charged, but it's still electron poor because it would like some more electrons to complete its octet. Okay, so we're going to show fluoride attacking the boron here. Um, I should have scooted this over a bit because I didn't leave enough room, so I'm going to show the product of this reaction down here, but ideally I would have drawn a straight arrow across. Okay, so that gets me to boron. Now has four bonds to fluorines. And if we go through and count for formal charge, boron now actually has the negative charge. Okay, so a couple of things to sort of error check here. One is we're taking electrons from the fluorine we're using them to new, make a new FB bond here. So, yep, this is a legal move. It's a lone pair on an atom, the fluorine, becoming a new bond to the fluorine and something else, the boron in this case. So, in other words, F lone pair electrons become FB bond electrons. Um, the other thing to double check here is um, we can go through and calculate formal charge for every atom in this thing, like we did back in chapter one when we were figuring out covalent structures. But it's a lot easier to keep track if you just think of it in terms of, okay, fluorine was negative. It lost some electron density in doing this attack. It's actually going to end up neutral as a result. Uh, meanwhile, boron was neutral. It got some electrons coming into it. So it should be ending up negative after, after that step. Um, so you can reason it out from first principles, but you can save yourself a lot of work if you just keep track of what's losing electrons and what's gaining electrons um, during this process. And one thing you should definitely double check is everything together up here adds up to a minus one charge. So everything down here better also add up to a minus one charge, otherwise we're violating charge conservation. Okay. Um, so questions about this example so far? Okay, cool. So second legal move is exactly the opposite of that. Bond to an atom becomes a lone pair on that atom. Okay, um, easiest example to draw of this is actually the reverse of the one I just drew. So if we start out with the product from that, BF4 minus, what I'm gonna do is take the electrons out of this BF bond, show a curved arrow dumping them back out onto the fluorine. So I'm saying this BF bond is going to become a new extra lone pair on the fluorine. All right, so one thing that um, is worth mentioning, and that is showing lone pair electrons or not. Um, in general, we're not going to show lone pair electrons unless they're participating in the reaction in some way. So these three Fs up the top, we just don't use their lone pairs at any point during either of these reactions, so I'm okay not to show them. Um, but I am doing something involving lone pairs on this bottom fluorine during the reaction, so I'm gonna show at least one lone pair here. And if I show one lone pair, I'd probably better show all of them just to keep things kind of 
um, sensible looking. So you don't always have to show lone pairs, but if you show one lone pair on an atom for any reason, you should show all of them. Um, sapling is sometimes a little over pedantic and asks you to show like all lone pairs on an atom for some of the problems. Um, so it helps to sort of read the full directions and see exactly what they're expecting from you format wise. Okay, so um, this is pretty much the reverse of what we did up here. Um, the BF bond, I guess to keep it consistent, the FB bond becomes a lone pair on fluorine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. or going back to BF3? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so exactly. So it's either like sticking on uh, one more fluorine atom to become BF4, or it's dropping that fluorine atom back off to go back to where it started. Why would it do that? Is it favorable for boron to be BF3? Um, good question. So really it kind of depends on, for one thing, like how much of these species you have around. Like if there's a ton of fluoride floating around with a minus charge, it's going to drive the reaction more towards the case where you've got an extra one stuck on there. Um, but it also kind of comes down to some other things like temperature, solvent, stuff like that. So for the time being, we're just looking at like if this were to happen, what mechanism would it happen by? And then like we'll worry about does it even happen later on? Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Question. And uh, what is a nucleophile? Sorry. A nucleophile is a thing that's going to throw its electrons and attack something else. So like for example, um, this one up here, the fluoride is doing the attack with its electrons, so it would be the nucleophile. Um, and then boron's accepting electrons, so it's the electrophile. Um, here it's a little bit less clear cut. I guess you could say like the BF4 minus is the nucleophile, um, but it's sort of not really attacking anything else as much as its own fluorine, so it's maybe a little bit less useful to use those labels here, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, other questions about this example? Okay, cool. All right, so third option is a bond to an atom becomes a different bond to that same atom. Okay, so here's one example, um, and we're going to hear a lot more from this reaction in the future, um, but for the time being, here's like a simple example of it. Okay, so here's a carbon with an H, uh, with a Br and three H's on it, um, and we have this thing, this rich OH, uh, electron rich OH thing, a hydroxide floating around nearby. Um, it makes sense to expect that this being electron rich is going to be the, what, nucleophile or electrophile? Nucleophile, yep, so it's going to do the attack. We're going to have the arrow come out of here and go attack somewhere else. This carbon here um, is slightly electron poor, and we know that because the bromine here is causing like a polar bond that sort of pulls the electron density out towards it. So this carbon, even though it's not like an unfilled octet like the boron was, is still slightly electrophilic. So we're going to have this OH group come out, attack the carbon, and then I'm going to show a second arrow at the same time here, and I'll talk a little bit more about why that's necessary in just a second. And you know what? Um, I actually shuffled my notes around. This is supposed to be an example of category one, so I'm going to erase this, sorry. Um, I'll come back to this example because there is something else that we need to talk about there, but I'm going to jump down ahead a little bit. Okay, so... Okay, um, 
So here's a different example that actually fits in this category. So a bond to an atom becoming a different bond to that atom. So what we're going to look at here is the electrons from this BH bond coming out, attacking onto hydrogen, and kicking out the OH. So this is kind of a, um, the electron rich species is over here, the BH4, and it's got a negative charge, so it's electron rich. But it doesn't actually have a lone pair to attack with. There's no like lone pair on boron. So the only electrons this thing has to attack with is the BH bond. So it's taking these electrons, coming out, attacking something else. And then that gets us to here. So we're taking the electrons from um, the BH bond and making a new HH bond. So the electrons start out associated with this hydrogen and they end up still associated with this hydrogen. They're just in a new bond to that atom at the end of things. OK. Um, I'm going to take a second and erase the board real quick. Oh, you know what? Um, we're actually at time just about. So that's a good place to wrap up.